This is how paramedics Midori Carmona and Sergio Villafan finish their shift. Racing down a highway on the outskirts of Mexico City, trying to find a hospital for Jose Luis Montaño, a COVID patient, just 39 years old. In Mexico, cases have kept rising. The death toll is now higher than Italy and Spain. Midori and Sergio run the gauntlet every day, trying to help their patients while protecting themselves. And right now, they need to find him a bed. The ambulance is just racing out to the hospital of Tescoco, and they're hoping that there's room there uh, for Jose Luis. Uh, but if there's not, we don't know yet, then they'll just have to take him to another hospital until they find one that does have space. It could be a long, hard ride just as it has been for a country still struggling to beat COVID. Latin America's turned into a virus epicenter. It's got 10% of the world's population, but over recent weeks has accounted for nearly half the daily death toll. And Mexico's one of the worst hit countries. About one in five of its inhabitants live in the capital, a beehive perfect for any virus looking to spread. Despite that, some question if its rise here was so inevitable, or if the region's second most populous country simply got it wrong. From the start, there have been questions. Why did Mexico test at one of the lowest rates in the world? Why was the quarantine so softly policed? And why did the country's president flout his own government's social distancing guidelines? We're here to find out why Mexico's death toll has become one of the highest in the world. We start in Midori and Sergio's patch, the working class suburb of Nezahualcoyotl. Like many other places in the capital, the streets are packed and the virus has hit hard. This is their first COVID case of the day, a policeman they've worked with before who's wondering if it isn't time to go to hospital. <laughs> He's well enough to stay home for now. It's just as well. The team are at full stretch. Llevo 20 años de carrera en el cual nunca había visto algo como como el de ahorita. Pensé que lo máximo que yo podía llegar a ver es el sismo del 19 de septiembre, pero ni uno como esto. Nada como esto, no es nada comparado a esto. The calls come in quick and fast. This is just one of three ambulances dedicated to picking up patients with COVID in a district of more than a million people. So as you can guess, they're almost constantly on the move. Él murió el 4 de mayo. In a rare break, Sergio tells us he's struggling with something else, even as he works. Uno de los servicios, por lo regular, fue con una persona de la tercera edad. Básicamente me acordó de, de mi abuelito, ya que él eh, igualmente pues, falleció de, de lo mismo. ¿no? Vi lo que son sus últimos minutos de, de vida y básicamente vi el reflejo de mi abuelito. He passed away just three weeks before we met Sergio. The memories with him every time he treats the elderly. Te quedas eh, sin en pensar de, pues es que no puedo hacer yo algo más, ¿no? Finally, it's the last call of the shift. The house of Jose Luis, a DHL delivery man. His blood oxygen level is so low, his vital organs are at risk. Necesitas atención médica. Necesitas ir a un hospital. No te vas a morir. Solo es para que te atiendan. Ahorita estás a tiempo. Okay. He agrees reluctantly. Families have refused to let Midori and Sergio take their relatives before. In Mexico, rumors have circulated, particularly in some poorer barrios, that hospitals are killing patients. Finally, his wife comes in to say goodbye.
Meanwhile, the team get geared up and bring in the capsule they hope will protect them. It's a tight fit, and it gets very hot inside it. Patients can get anxious, claustrophobic too. And it could be a long ride if the first hospital can't take him. A lot depends on it having space. It's time to get out and see if they'll let him in. This time, they get lucky. Entonces en esta ocasión como éxito básicamente. Sí, estuvo muy bien el servicio. Sí, creo que fue rápida la, la recepción. Una vez tardamos un poquito más de 40 minutos. It's a triumphant end to a hard shift for Midori and Sergio. But this is just the start for Jose Luis. For most people, COVID amounts to little more than a severe flu. But for those who are taken to the other side of these hospital doors, it's a different world. We've come to the intensive care unit at Juarez Hospital on the other side of the city. It was built for a 19th century war, but now the staff are heading into a new battle. The enemy this time round leaves few survivors here once patients can't breathe for themselves. Exhausted nurse Julio Cesar Camilo, 32, has struggled to come to terms with that. And in Mexico, that's not just the old and the sick. Another worrying pattern has emerged. Just had a quick check around this intensive care unit, and one thing that really strikes you is that everyone is under the age of 60 here, and that's a real change in the trend from Europe, for example, when it seemed like the more elderly were the most at risk. Por qué yo creo que se da eso? Por el destino que tenemos los mexicanos. Hay a veces que obesidad, hay veces que hay enfermedades agregadas, como la hipertensión. The country consumes more junk food per capita than any other in Latin America. Three quarters of Mexican adults are overweight or obese. One in ten have diabetes. Both conditions complicate coronavirus. And that's put an already creaky public health system under added pressure. Authorities have made sure it's never reached max capacity but even in Juarez, one of the better equipped hospitals, Dr. Angelica Rodriguez says they lack basic medicine. For example, there are some antibiotics that in some of them we use, that there are not in the hospital. No hay. So the family have to buy them. Is it going to be delayed? Yes, but we don't have another option. Many other Mexican hospitals are in a worse state. Doctors and nurses across the country told us they lack gear and training. Perhaps because of that, they've got infected at one of the highest rates in the world. The staff here want that sacrifice to count. With the images that you're allowing us to broadcast, what, what do you hope that this achieves? Es una situación muy desesperante a veces. No probamos un alimento en siete, ocho horas. No podemos tomar este agua. Pues damos lo mejor de cada uno. Pero también quisiéramos este, facilitar a la gente que, que nos apoyen. That message is clearly not getting through to some Mexicans. We rode home with intensive care nurse Osvaldo Bertiz after his shift. Mira estos. Tren personal del hospital. Oh, estos es combis. Ajá. Yeah. Porque gente de civil. Sí. Agredía al personal de enfermería y entonces nos pusieron transporte. While in other countries they're heroes, Mexico has become notorious for attacks against frontline medical staff. Pues piensan que nosotros traemos el virus por estar en el hospital. Si te fijas, yo vengo de civil, 
cuando originalmente tendría que venir de blanco con mi uniforme. Pero vengo de civil porque la gente te agrede, te discrimina. Y a un compañero hace como do, un mes y medio en la calle le arrojaron cloro. Entonces esos transportes nos los pone el hospital y cuando sales te llevan al metro otra vez para limitar un poco las agresiones físicas hacia nosotros. It's hard to understand it all when you see firsthand the sacrifices medical workers are making. Osvaldo is self-isolated from his partner Alondra, who's three months pregnant. A ver, enseñan la, la, el bebé, la panza. La panza. Sí. Es que creo que casi no se ve, ¿o sí? Poquito. En el hospital tratas de ayudar, pero aquí en tu casa de esas pues eres un peligro. Una parte. Y los, el precio que pagas, pues, pues ojalá la gente entendiera. Video calls have been their only contact for two months. Tú te tienes que cuidar. Tienes que tomar todas las precauciones porque tienes que estar bien por ti y por nosotros para que el día de mañana ya nos podamos ver y ver a nuestro bebé. Va a pasar, va a pasar. Todo va a pasar. But it's passing slower than they or anyone else anticipated. Bye. Probably because vast areas of the capital never actually stopped, even in the lockdown. This is Iztapalapa, the capital's most populous district and the worst hit by COVID. We found queues of hearses outside the cemetery, but they weren't the only ones circulating. Just look at the amount of people and cars that are out on the streets. I should mention that not every business here is open. Many of those that can afford to close have done so. But it's pretty clear that in the more working class areas of the city, there are a lot of people out and about. Among them, Eduardo González, a microbus driver. La gente sí tiene miedo, pero también tiene necesidad. Y hay veces que tiene más necesidad que miedo. Yo tengo miedo de contagiarme yo, contagiar a mi familia, contagiar a mi mamá, que es una persona de la tercera edad. Pero desgraciadamente tengo la necesidad. Si no trabajo, ¿de qué voy a vivir? It's been a tough decision for him, but others don't even believe in COVID. They think it's a government conspiracy. O se molesta nada que tú que crees en eso, que es un mito, que es una mentira. And some are simply willing to take a gamble. Hay pasajeros que se suben sin cubrebocas, son necios, no entiende. Desgraciadamente, yo vivo de ellos. Pues yo me tengo que, este, que aguantar y subirlos. Authorities encouraged, but didn't force people to stay home, and often turned a blind eye towards those breaking the rules. As the lockdown went on, more and more went out and cases went not down, but up. And this monster in the heart of Iztapalapa was an epicenter. It's called the Central de Abasto. It's one of the biggest fruit and veg markets in the world, the size of more than 400 football pitches. When we visited, COVID was ripping through these crowded aisles. We dress like this to go in, knowing what awaited us. But most people here work with next to no protection. When you're lifting this, even a mask is a lot. And as for not touching others... This place gets half a million visitors every day. There's really no way that they can keep social distancing going with that quantity. Market officials said they've managed to lower visitor numbers but most of the workers that we talked to had already been sick. Have there been people from your section that have died in this? Sí, algunos, algunos de aquí de esta zona, sí. Sí, como, pongamos unos diez o nueve. Alejandro was out sick for a month too, but he had to come back. Porque en el tiempo que estuve, pues se acabó los ahorritos que teníamos. But the Mexico City government, which runs the market, decided it couldn't shut it down. 
90,000 workers and the capital's entire food chain depend on it. So they took a different tack, sending in 400 health workers. And stepping up COVID testing, delivering results in two days, far quicker than many other clinics here. It was all done very late, but infections started to come down. And that's called attention. In part because it's so different to the national government's approach. Mexico has one of the lowest testing rates worldwide. And that's a conscious choice made by this man, Hugo lopez Gatel, formerly a respected but little-known epidemiologist. Now the country's coronavirus SAR. The World Health Organization. Yes. Their answer to this, to COVID, was test, test, test. That's what you've <laughs> got to do. You've gone the other way. Mexico's got a very low test count. Why? Pick a country. The cases that have been reported by the government of that country, is that number of cases the real one? Is really the real one? What we have done, we said, this kind of phenomena cannot be measured directly. Therefore, we have no intention in identifying by direct observation the real burden of the disease. Instead, we have used statistical methods, mathematical methods of recognizing proportions in the population. He openly admits that due to the low testing, Mexico's real case and death toll is inevitably much higher than the official figures. Critics say that means the country has little idea of the severity of the crisis. Does that mean that the population then don't understand the true dimensions of this? And what we've seen, which is more people out on the streets, if they knew how big this was, wouldn't they be more likely to stay inside? Well, it depends on how you handle the aspect. I never quite got an answer to that question, but the government chose to invest in more hospital beds rather than testing, and they haven't run out of those. But their soft lockdown's been controversial too. Do you sometimes regret not going harder on the quarantine? So at least in that period when Mexico was in real lockdown, you couldn't get this a bit more under control then? If you ask the tension that may arise from law enforcement, the use of police or military force, is sort of a perfect way to have a clash. We, we just remove the, the incentives to go out. If you have no job to attend because it's closed, you have no school to attend because it's closed, why would you go out? I mean, I suppose it all makes sense. The problem with that is that people are still going out now and they, and they have been all through the quarantine. That's correct. It is well known that community mitigation has its limits, as well as contention has its limits. One man without too many limits is the country's president, Andres Manuel López Obrador. He was out and about hugging supporters, even as his own government called for social distancing. He's shown off an amulet as his own protection. And he just got back from a week-long trip around South Mexico when we talked to López Gatel. What do you think of the president heading out on tour while you're telling everyone, please, Stay at home. Right, right. I reply with this. The president is working, is doing his job. Does it not seem to you that, well, help me out a bit here. I'm trying to get everyone to stay in, in, in the house. Sure, if it's not an absolute sure. emergency, set an example. No, I, I understand. But at the same time, I'm aware that there's this overreaction to whatever any president, I guess, but especially this president does. He won't criticise his boss, and both of them worry about the same thing. Mexico's economy, the other great victim of COVID. The International Monetary Fund's diagnosis is that it will suffer the worst of all Latin America's five major nations. But President López Obrador refuses to apply the medicine it prescribes, a comprehensive rescue package, as even the conservative governments of Chile and Brazil have done. He's wary of debt, 
and is relying largely on small loans for some businesses and topping up already existing social programs to get through this. Hemos comenzado a promover la recuperación económica. Se está impulsando la creación de dos millones de empleos nuevos. But many economists say there's no way that's going to happen. An estimated 12 million Mexicans lost their income just in April. Among them, Nancy Guevara and her family. They invited us into the two rooms this family of eight share. They've been out all day hunting for food. Pues nosotros empezamos desde las diez y media y venimos llegando a tu pobre casa a las doce, una de la mañana por estar buscando de comer, dónde conseguir leche, dónde conseguir pañales, la comida para todos nosotros. Before the pandemic, Nicolás worked as a security guard and Nancy sold sweets in a market. Between them, they could feed the family. But both of them lost their jobs when the epidemic began. Nancy told us when we first met her at a soup kitchen. No, y por desgracia, pues, dos pequeños, mi mamá, mi otra bebé, dependen de mí, pero pues hay que echarle. This donated food is the only reason they're not starving. And they're not alone. The country's development agency says that eventually the pandemic could push between 6 and 10 million people into extreme poverty. By the end of June, it was already happening. We went to 16 soup kitchens across the capital. All of them told us that lines had grown. Many said they're serving three or four times more meals than before. What we found coming to these soup kitchens is that there's a lot of people here from the informal sector, street vendors, rubbish collectors, market workers, people that were already poor, and this has just tipped them over the edge. Even as the needs increased, the number of soup kitchens themselves has fallen. It's a risk turning out to feed people right now. Yo no me digo de situación de calle, pero la verdad, pues casi, casi bien. Casi, casi, y, y si no fuera por toda la gente y en los lugares donde ahorita nos están apoyando, la verdad, anduviera vendiendo un, un riñón, un brazo para darles de comer a mis hijos. By the time we left them at the end of the day, the family had got food. In the morning, the battle would begin again. Success stories might be hard to come by in Mexico's near future. Here, at least, is one. Remember José Luis Montaño, who we last saw wheeled into hospital in a capsule? After a month inside, he's finally come home. Todas las cartas que me mandaron estuvieron muy bonitas. Tus dibujos, bonita. Estuvieron bonitos, mami. Y la foto. Esa sí la traigo. Pero me quería traer. Me quería traer todo, pero no podemos sacar nada. Porque todo está impecable. He's not out of the woods yet. His lungs are damaged and recovery will be slow. <laughs> but he sees this as a second chance. Ser una mejor persona. La nueva vida que me dio Dios. Para ser una buena, una mejor persona. Hacer entender a la gente que esto no es un juego. Que es en realidad es cierto. Que se cuiden. Que usen tapabocas. Porque si está, está muy difícil. But the country's opening up, rather than masking up. 
With the quarantine gradually ending, it still hasn't beaten COVID. Perhaps authorities could have done more, but they and the millions on the breadline here have decided they can't stay home any longer.